So, V Wars, have you seen it? I know I've never critiqued TV on this channel before, but when it comes to V Wars, I think I speak for every vampire enthusiast on Earth when I say, what the hell did I just watch? And it really pains me to say this, and it pains me to make this video, because I love Ian Somerhalder as an actor, I loved him in The Vampire Diaries, Damon was hands down my favourite TV vampire, I stalk him on Instagram, and when he started talking about doing a new vampire show, I was so excited about that, I literally had the December 5th V Wars release date written in my calendar, I was there for it straight in, and I have to say, V Wars shocked me in that it ever made it all the way to the screen. Because I have legitimately never seen such amateurish writing and directing with so many gaping plot holes and flaws in it that just didn't make any sense. I don't know how this rolling mess made it all the way through production to the screen with season one, you know, season one you expect the plotline to be smooth, you expect it to be a good idea that has been brought to the screen, and you know, most shows do fall to bits over the following seasons, the longer they run, usually the worse they get, but season one, for God's sake, there's no excuse for plot holes in season one. But that was what was going on with V Wars. So uh, I just want to break down everything that was wrong with this freaking show, because as far as I'm concerned, V Wars is best used as an educational piece on how not to write. Uh, this is a book that I've owned for a few years, speaking as a writer myself and as a writer of vampire stories, uh, this book has a whole bunch of examples of pretty typical bad writing, uh, bad characters, bad plot, how to bore your audience, it's, it's basically a lesson on how to write the worst novel possible so that you hopefully do the opposite, but the thing is, V Wars was, was pretty much like this book acted out on TV. So I'm, I'm just going to dive straight in with the freaking critique. Um, so first of all, V Wars did not work because of the fact that it was obvious that whoever was writing it, and I am intrigued, who wrote V Wars? Have they ever written anything that's gone to screen before? As I say, this, this, whoever wrote it, they clearly in their mind had seen, you know, just, just like everyone does with their writing projects. You love it, you love the characters, you think you're expressing them beautifully, you think everybody else is going to understand them and love them just the way that you do, but that only happens if you put it into the writing in a way that is explained to other people, and the writer of V Wars did not do that. The main example of this was backstory. Hi, hi V Wars, do we know what backstory is? Clearly not, because there was not a single character in the entire show who had any backstory. So the, the show, and yes there are going to be spoilers obviously in this video, there is no way for me to critique this without dropping spoilers, uh, I would say I will try and stay as vague as I can, but I think I'm going to have to drop some pretty heavy spoilers. But anyway, the, the main relationship that this show revolves around um, is between Ian Somerhalder's character, Luther Swan, who is this scientist doctor guy who is kind of on the front lines of trying to stop this terrifying vampire disease from spreading, and also the black guy, Mike, uh, Luther's kind of best friend who becomes a vampire, and then it's like, oh no, well now they're on different sides. So the relationship between these two characters, it's clearly supposed to be very close, um, you know, they refer to each other as brothers, there's, there's multiple occasions when um, Luther talks about the fact, I owe him my life, I owe him my life multiple times over, but you see the thing is, you never get to hear how they know each other, or why he owes him his life, because, you know, it just seemed like a, a bit of a sort of American corny exaggeration when you just say, I owe that guy my life multiple times over, but you don't say how, throughout the course of a whole season, you don't say how you owe him your life, you know, were they in the military together, did they grow up together, how, how did they know each other, why was there this relationship, because the whole show revolved around the fact that you know, these guys are on opposite sides of this terrible war, but they have this deep, meaningful friendship, but 
what what meaningful friendship if you don't show the audience what it's based on nobody knows because literally no one had a backstory and the black guy mike the, the sort of main vampire he particularly like who was he as a character before he became a vampire all you see is oh he's driving a fast car he's like the you know the cool kind of bulked up muscular suave black guy driving a sports car and uh, and then he flies a helicopter when luther asks him to he's kind of the cool sort of action guy but you don't you don't get any backstory you know where where does he get this fast car from uh you know what what is his job what is his background because when he becomes a vampire he becomes a fugitive so all this money he presumably has because of the fast car and all of that what's what's his story what is this job that he's presumably abandoning when he goes off and becomes a vampire fugitive there's no backstory whatsoever and exactly the same thing applied to the relationship between luther swan and his wife his wife is killed off in episode one which is a damn shame because she's a good actress despite the fact that she was essentially playing exactly the same character she played in i zombie she was exactly the same kind of oh really like cool girl girlfriend oh she makes slutty jokes and she's she's kind of funky and sexy and that's who she is so i, I just see her as bozio i don't see her as a different character she is literally Bozio from iZombie. They just transplanted her into V Wars. Lazy, lazy writing. But anyway, she's killed in the first episode, and obviously, it's it's this very obvious plot point that oh my god, Luther loses his wife to the vampire disease. He has to kill her himself. Oh, it's brutal. Now he's personally involved in the tragedy, but you don't feel anything for this loss of his wife because a no backstory you don't know what they saw in each other how long they'd been married and then worst of all when she died when luther killed her there was there was no like emotional aftermath at all you didn't see him shed a single tear there was literally no funeral scene for his wife all, all that happened was he was handed um the the cremation urn and uh, and somebody said oh uh, you know condolences and he just said wow you know no one said that to me yet um but and then it's just breezed over it's like your wife became a vampire and you had to stab her to death in front of your son Th this is quite a dramatic thing and, and and yet it's just it's just well this is a plot point we needed to get him into the story but we're not we're not going to have any of the necessary grieving which you know if there had have been some grieving it would have bulked up the character of luther because luther just like all the other characters in v wars is a cardboard cutout he has no no backstory you don't you don't know anything about his childhood growing up up, you know how he knew Mike uh what got him into the medical field um there's there's also this this crazy ex-wife character who y you do wonder was she written into the script just because she's played by Ian Somerhalder's real life wife and he wanted her to be a part of the show so they they put in this crazy wife character but the, the crazy wife character um you wonder how was this sensible, uh, really intelligent, really good looking doctor, why did he end up with a woman whose only personality trait is being batshit crazy? How did he end up with her for long enough to have a child? Um, wh why did that happen? Don't know, don't know, we just wanted Ian Summerhalder's wife to have a job in this show, so we, we, we made her a crazy lady with no other personality traits whatsoever. Um, and again, with the, the, the cardboard cutout issues with the characters, Mike, the, the black guy, the, the, big, the big powerful vampire, the only thing you really know about this guy is that he's a good guy. That, you know, he, Luther considers him a brother. He saved Luther's life multiple times. God knows how. You don't get told. Luther's a good guy. Mike's a good guy. But then, when Mike becomes a vampire, and in this show, the vampires are not just sort of, oh, you drink a bit of blood and, and you, you leave some people alive. No, they, they basically they kill all their victims they just rip their throats right out and they're dead so mike goes from being a good guy to being a vampire who murders people mercilessly left right and center and no he does not lose his soul or undergo any demonic personality changes when becoming a vampire that would have been easy logic for this complete u-turn in personality but they were too lazy even to use that shtick or the writer just did not think to you know use any sort of logic at all now the first two people to get infected with the disease 
they kill themselves because they can't live with the fact that they've become murderers. Whereas Mike goes from, oh, I'm, I'm a good guy, to when Luther tries to help him and says, look, we can find a cure for this, you know, let's, let's try and help you. Mike, the good guy, who's become a murderer, suddenly says, no, I don't want that. I'm a new species. I'm, I feel fast and strong. And uh, I'm a new species. I have a, d a right to live just like you do. What, even though you're murdering people on the daily with no self-control whatsoever, how, how does Mike go from good guy to, to this? Uh, it, it made no sense whatsoever. Um, and then there was, there was also the, uh, the terrible, terrible death scene in about episode two or three, which was another issue with lack of backstory. The, there's a woman who appears to be about 23, 24, working for a government agency. You don't know anything about her. She appears to be very young. She's probably not senior in the company, probably too young to have a family. She, you know, she seems very cold, very emotionless. You don't know much about her. And only five seconds before she dies, do you find out that, oh, maybe, maybe she's actually kind of rooting for him. Maybe she's a good guy. I don't know. Let's, let's see where it goes. Oh, and then pff, car gets blown up. She's dead. And at this point, there is hands down the most ridiculous scene in the whole show, which is this absolutely cringe inducing slow motion um thing of of luther with the car having blown up and he's like no! in slow motion no! you know flames everywhere tire rolling past no! uh, you know it, it's it's slow motion and it's really dramatic but for slow motion dramatic oh my god tragedy to work the audience has to be invested, otherwise it just looks ridiculous, and sadly it did look ridiculous. Because it's like, hang on, what, why are we getting this crazy death scene for a woman we didn't care about, when when it came to Luther's wife, who we mildly cared about, uh, she she didn't really get any death scene, she, she didn't really get uh, a funeral or anything, nobody really cared about her despite the fact she was his wife, but when there's this, this random young government worker flunky gets blown up, Luther is suddenly like, oh, slow motion! I've noticed that slow motion tragedy scenes <laughs> seem to be the last refuge of bad TV writers who realise they have failed to put any emotion into a death scene, but they're desperate to do it somehow. So they go for the slow motion. Uh, a good example is in the final season of Dexter, which I think everyone can agree was terrible. Uh, when his sister Deb gets shot, it's, oh my god, I've been shot. You know, it's, it's very <laughs> like that. And it always looks ridiculous. But in the case of V-Wars with this death, to compound how ridiculous it was, they tell you who the character was and why you should care about her after she dies. They tell you after she dies that no, um, it was just bad casting, the fact that she looked 24. Apparently she's actually meant to be 38. Yeah, the bad casting, I'm going to be getting to that in a minute. But, um, so she's, she's not actually a young flunky with no family working for the government, but, you know, probably just a secretary. No, she, she's actually 38. Um, so she's a senior member of the company. Oh, and the thing that really matters, she actually had two young children. She was a mother of two guys you have to care when she dies. Maybe people would if you had have told them that before she died. You know, you have to be invested in a character before you kill them off with a slow motion death scene. And it would have been so easy to interject that into the plot. Luther has a kid, she has kids. Why couldn't she just have had a picture of her kids on the desk? And when she's talking to Luther, she says, look, I know, I know the stresses of bringing your son into this, this whole thing breaking out, you know, working in this job. I have two kids of my own. I'm worried about them. This, this vampire thing breaking out. It's very worrying as a mother. You know, it would have been easy to have that conversation in the plot and realise, oh, this character has depth. We need to care when she dies. But no, they, they told us that after she died. It, it was nonsense. But the, the really, really biggest um, plot hole in the whole thing and the thing that was just so stupid, I was like, what, what are you even doing? Um, 
this is this is kind of the flip side of what was my favorite part of v wars because the the overall premise of v wars i thought was very cool was that um the vampire disease breaks out because the arctic ice has these prehistoric diseases frozen into it. So with climate change melting the Arctic ice, these kind of ancient diseases are breaking loose and they're infecting people and that's where it comes from. And Luther Swan becomes, you know, the, the centerpiece of this because he's been having lectures about this and he's been saying this is going to happen and then it does. So there's, there's this very unique kind of very in the moment kind of on the on the nose of what's going on at the moment kind of climate change related aspect of like climate change releasing scientific diseases all this this clever new slant on how vampirism could break out i thought that was cool but the thing is right luther is a doctor and a scientist he's a specialist in these prehistoric prions or whatever they were calling them and he's studying the vampire disease. From day one, he has been studying the vampire disease. Now, a few episodes in, it turns out that there's a second species of vampire too. And these ones, they don't just rip people's throats out. They have fangs which have this drug in them. So they feed on people and the people get really, really high and sedated and they get addicted to the vampire venom. So these, these vampires are a lot cooler, you know, they're kind of sprawling around all day, surrounded by doped out, half-eaten humans, and they, they live a lovely sort of decadent, properly vampiric lifestyle, and they're quite cool. But the thing where it all fell apart is that, first of all, you hear this, the red-headed vampire, who is this new species of vampire, you hear her refer to what she is, with a name that it seems like she's come up with. It, it was something like Vespertillo. It wasn't that, but it was something, something like Vespertillo. And then about an episode later, you see Luther Swan in the lab and he's with the government people. They're looking at a, at a house with a heat seeking camera on it and they can see there are some humans in there and some vampires. And at that point he says, oh, hang on guys, that one's a Vespertillo. They, they feed in a different way wait, ha hang on a minute, uh, A, how is the doctor in the laboratory using the same technical term for these vampires as one random vampire in the wild who has had no contact with science or the laboratory, she barely knows what she is, but she's embracing it and she's come up with this term on her own. Uh, how are these two people who've had nothing to do with each other using the same scientific term? That was a mind-blowingly stupid plot hole. But more than that, as I say, Luther Swan, he's a doctor, he's a scientist, this is his specialty, he studies the vampiric disease. So if he discovered that the disease that had been released initially had mutated into a new strain producing a second sort of vampire, that would be big news. That would be a big thing for him to study. Hang on, guys. You know, hang on, government guys. We need to study this. There are more than one strain of vampire. What we think we're looking for in a vampire, it might not be right because the disease is mutating. Maybe there are more than two. It, it should have been a big plot point, but it was It was just skipped over. And also, you, you didn't even hear how Luther Swan found out that there was a second species of vampire. There was never any mention of him studying it or him going, oh my goodness, look, the disease has mutated. No, just, just randomly, oh, oh, I seem to know magically that another species of vampire that I magically know about without doing any studying. It was nonsense. It made no sense whatsoever. Um, and then, yeah, again, the deaths. Uh, <laughs> v Wars killed off basically every single character on the show. Um, and they, they were clearly taking tips here from shows like Game of Thrones and The Walking Dead, where characters are killed like crazy. Um, but it, it does seem to be becoming a new trend now to like kill your characters a lot. Um, but the writer of V-Wars, again in a very amateurish fashion, had clearly seen these shows and gone, oh, this makes things really poignant. If you kill main characters and suddenly nobody's safe just because it's fiction doesn't mean they're safe. People can die. Um, the trouble is, again, if you kill a character that has no backstory, no depth, no complexity, no wit, nothing, 
and you kill them, it's not poignant, it's pointless, nobody cares. Um, and to be honest, when you kill someone who has not yet developed any personality traits or any backstory, people just go, wait, what are you trying to do? Because if, if there's a character introduced in a show and you don't really know who they are yet, they haven't really become a person yet, maybe there's, there's little hints of, oh, they, they, might, they might be becoming someone, you assume it's, it's going somewhere, but you don't really care about them yet. So if you cut off their timeline and kill them dead at this point, people are just thinking, well, why did you even have this character in the show in the first place? They had, they had no personality traits, they had no depth, they weren't an individual, they weren't interesting, uh, and then you killed them. So honestly, you didn't even need to write that character into the show at all. Um, and, and this was the thing, but they, they just kept killing people and you were supposed to think, oh, what a poignant moment, but you didn't because nobody had any depth. And I, I think a lot of this was to do with the writing of, of the dialogue, that the dialogue was, was just dull. All the characters were just dull. There was nobody really who had particularly any charisma, any wit, there, there, was, there was nothing going on there. But I think possibly the most shockingly appalling element of V Wars was the... Uh, what, is, what is frankly a lesson in how not to write a villain ever. Um, the bad guy, the evil guy, I think his, his name was Klaus Nicholson or something, which seemed... Um, a little bit of a of a nod towards the originals, Klaus Michelson, Klaus Nicholson. Um, but anyway, he's he's this evil government guy. And the thing, you know, the thing that, that books like this, every creative writing course in the world, and honestly common sense teaches you, is that no character should ever be wholly good or wholly evil. If you write a character who is 100% good, you know, they're, they're gorgeous, uh, they're really intelligent, they're really witty, they're great in bed, they're lovely to their girlfriend, they're lovely to their mum, they're lovely to their cat, they give to charity, they work really hard, and there's nothing wrong with them, they're not a believable character, for starters, and also you're not going to really like that character. They're going to seem either boring or obnoxious, and certainly you don't believe them. It's when you create a character like that, who has some sort of really dark underlying thing, or actually they have some sort of gigantic flaw that comes out, that that's when you become this, this messy tangle of characteristics, which is what a real person is. You know, we all have contradictory elements, and the same goes for villains. Villains, unless they are in, like, superhero movies where everything is, you know, very simplified, black and white, good and evil, you know, and even, even superhero movies generally do better when you have characters who are struggling with good and evil and thinking, you know, do I, do I want to be a superhero? Do I really want to do this? Or, you know, uh, that, that's, that's more believable than someone who is just, whoa, I'm the evil guy. But, um, in V Wars, this, this Klaus Nicholson character, um, all you really see him doing is being evil. You know, he's, he's always on the phone, in, in the dark, in dark rooms, on the phone to other kind of grey, sinister government people saying, yes, I will get it done, yes, I will kill Luther Swan if he becomes a problem. Um, you know, he's always being evil. But the thing is, the one thing <laughs> that this guy seems to be about throughout the whole season is he wants to shut down the vampire disease, and he is willing to do it at any cost. Even if he has to kill humans to do it, even even if he has to lock humans in like torture camps to stop the spread of the disease, he will do it. So he's evil, but he's kind of got a good cause, right? He's trying to save humanity, he's just doing it in a very kind of brutal way. But then, just before the end of the season, uh, big spoiler, but you need to hear it, um, he decides to deliberately infect himself with the vampire disease so that he can then turn up on TV and say, I have realised that the humans are going to lose this war. The, you know, th this war that I basically have been spearheading. I have been the one trying to save humanity, but oh, actually I realised humanity is not going to win. So I have now made myself a vampire and we are going to eat you. <laughs> it was like... 
I'm sorry, I was rendered completely speechless by the stupidity of the plot at this point in the recording. But yes, this guy goes on to say, oh, we're also putting the vampire disease in the water supply so that the majority of humans will be turned into vampires. Um, This guy really has no other agenda apart from do evil at any cost. It's like his whole calendar just says Tuesday, do evil, Wednesday, do evil. He also tries to kill Luther numerous times in increasingly strange ways for seemingly no reason just because it's the evil thing to do. Um, And yet this guy is supposed to be a high up government agent so clearly he's not batshit crazy. He makes no sense. And the, the other problem here with this government agent putting the vampire disease in the water supply is who exactly are you going to live on? Um, They've they've realised that the vampires need human blood to live. They kill every victim they feed on. So how does turning everyone into vampires solve the crisis? Because you're going to run out of food and die anyway. It's mental. It makes no sense. Stupid, 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 stupid. Anyway, returning to the video. <laughs> that That really was the point at which I was like, OK, I've literally watched the whole season now. And genuinely, there is not one redeeming feature in it. Um... And, and yes, the, the bad casting, the bad casting. There, there were at least three incidents where characters did not remotely match the ages of the actors playing them. So uh, Luther's wife, meant to be 33, looks more like about 38, but whatevs, she's only in it for one episode. But then, yes, there, there was the woman who was supposed to be 38, looked more like she was about 23, 24, and you were left to assume everything about her. You weren't told that she had children. You weren't told that she was high up in the company until after she was dead. And you might have you might have assumed those things if they'd actually casted a 38-year-old looking actress. You might have thought, oh, she looks senior. Oh, I bet she's a mum by now. You might have thought those things. But when you stick a 23-year-old looking actress in a 38-year-old role and don't tell them that actually, oh, th this woman's just had like a lot of Botox or something, I it doesn't make any sense. And then there was also this this other character, this this 19 year old character who keeps repeating that she's 19. You know, oh, I'm only 19. I can't be the leader of a vampire thing. Or I'm 19. I'm a teenager. I sleep all the time. It's like, love, it doesn't matter how many times you tell us you're a teenager. It doesn't make it true. You look about 28. Um, now, I know that Hollywood does have a big thing for, for miscasting teenagers, for, you know, for making 30 year olds go back to high school in uh, in movies. Oh, oh yes, we have me with my with my beard and my gigantic muscles. I'm uh, I'm really 15. But in this case, when when her being a teenager is supposed to be so pivotal to the thing that she has to keep repeating it, for God's sake, use a teenage actress. It, it was it was a bit ridiculous. Um, but yeah, the the character killing again. The only two characters who really had any kind of depth or charisma to them were Mike, the main vampire guy who you know was a was a good fit for the role he you know he was this this powerhouse he was very charismatic I mean you know the the oh I'm such a good guy I've saved Luther's life and oh now I've started murdering people but I, I deserve to live this way I know I'm being offered a cure but actually I'd rather be a murderer but nonetheless once you accept it okay this this show makes no sense I'll keep watching it anyway you kind of thought yeah he, he you know he's charismatic he's a good leader of the vampires so his death when they killed him, or presumably they killed him, because um, they didn't really show it. And if it was a well-written show, I would think, ah, oh, ah, oh, they're going to bring him back at some point. But it was such a badly written show that I'm pretty sure he's dead. They just did it in a terrible way. So this character who you, you care about, kind of, you know, he's about the only one who's interesting. Um, when they kill him, rather than this uh, slow motion death that they gave to the woman you didn't give a fig about, with him, that they just poison him so that they make him a bit a bit weak, which was not a good move because you know his his strength and his charisma is, is really the one thing he has going for him as a character. So you weaken him, and I mean that that could have been interesting. That that could have been interesting if we weaken this leader. He's supposed to lead an army of vampires and nobody knows that he doesn't have powers anymore or whatever. No, that they didn't run with any of the potential plot lines. They just stuck him in a van and drove him off to be killed and, and you didn't see it.
It's like, this is the only character you're invested in. If you're going to kill him, you should make a moment out of that. And then the other character that you actually kind of found interesting, or I did, was the slutty, red-headed Vespertillo vampire, who was more interesting than the rest of the vampires because she wasn't just a crazy killing machine. She was this, you know, sexy, sexy, seductive redhead who goes around drugging her victims. And her death, too, you, you didn't see it. All that happened was that her vigilante sister, and again, this vigilante sister, no backstory whatsoever. What was her job? What was her relationship with her sister before they both became vampires? Why was it that when she became a vampire, suddenly she was able to ditch all of her responsibilities in life and become a crazy vampire-killing vigilante like Blade? And then when she meets her sister, and there's this, what potentially could have been a big showdown between two sisters, one of whom has embraced vampirism, one of whom wants to wipe out all the other vampires, it wasn't a big scene. You know, there should have been a whole pleading on your knees moment, you know, a whole, but I'm your sister, don't you remember when we were five years old and I was scared of a storm and you were comforting me and you said you'd be there for me forever and now we're vampires together, you can't kill me, we've got to work this out together. You, you could have had a whole thing, but no, it was just, I'm a one-note vigilante, this is all I do, I kill vampires, I have no other personality traits, uh, and, oh, I'm, I'm a slutty, slutty evil redhead I, I am not going to beg for my life I'm, I'm not into redemption I'm just a one note character too so all you saw was the gun drawn black screen bang uh, did you not have the budget for a death scene that day or something what what was going on there yes it was it was just just basically a hot mess from beginning to end but the, the really crazy thing is they are clearly trying to go for a second season because the final episode, when all you have left is, is the 19-year-old who doesn't remotely look 19 and also acts really out of character all the time, you know, she seems to worship Mike, wants him to be in power and then she kind of goes around and kills him even though it seems like she actually hates the red-headed girlfriend way more than him, so why doesn't she just take her out of the picture? Doesn't make any sense. But anyway, so she's left in it, and the, the evil guy, the evil guy who, who again acts out of character like crazy, he's still there, and obviously Luther is there, because Luther has to be, because honestly the whole show was very clearly just, oh, vampire fans are some of the most faithful fans out there when it comes to watching things. You know that the Vampire Diaries ran on for, what, seven or eight seasons? It spawned the originals, which ran for multiple seasons, then it spawned that terrible high school thing. Um, vampire fans, my theory about why vampire fans are so faithful to their fandoms is that if you like vampires, you are clearly drawn to the idea of immortality, which probably means that, like me, you don't really like change. <laughs> so when you love a character or a show, you want it to run forever. You don't want anyone to die. You, you don't want anything to change. Which means that if that is your mentality, and you are drawn to vampires because of that mentality, when you love a show, you are going to be faithful to it to the death. So Netflix knew this. They knew, you know, we've got Vampire Diaries originals, all the rest of it up there. People are streaming this all the time. If we can get the actor who played Damon into another vampire-related show, we are laughing. People are gonna go for it. But I just don't know how they couldn't have found a show that was even half decent. Because, I mean, this was an amateurish clusterfuck. But yeah, as I say, final episode. Obviously, Ian Somerhalder's character is still alive. But now he's all the way through the season. He Honestly, he's been kind of, kind of dreadful to watch because Ian was so cool as Damon. And now in V Wars, he's this kind of awkward, stumbling, nerdy, khaki pant wearing, useless doctor. Um, and it, it's just a bit crap. And you... Is it like you can almost see Ian somehow just struggling to bring the character any sort of life at all? That, you know, Damon had so many mannerisms about him and so many things that, that made him Damon, whereas the Luther character is, is a plank of wood. You know, he has no backstory, no history, no, no genuine feelings at all. So it's like you're, you're giving a really good actor this, this empty character. There's no dialogue that, that gives him any inkling of, okay, this is who the character is, this is how I should play them. 
So, you know, he's just a blank space the entire series. But in the final episode of the season, you know, all this trauma has happened to him. And you, you see this back shot of him doing pull-ups. And when he turns around, he's all buff. He's grown a beard. And uh, <laughs> he's a masculine, toughened soldier now. And uh, he's ready to fight the war. Um, so that they're clearly gearing up for this season two. Basically, the whole thing was a vehicle for, right, we, we really want uh, Ian Somerhalder to play this, this cool vampire fighting guy. Uh, so we, we're going to have this whole clusterfuck of a first season just to get to that place where we're going to try and start season two, which is, seems to be the season we really want to write. <sighs> Honey, <laughs> honey, you could have started it with Luther Swan as a badass and you could have flashbacked to, oh, the, the vampire disease outbreak. Oh, you know, the, the backstory with Mike. Oh, no, Mike becomes a vampire. Oh, there's the falling out. Oh, there's some tragedies. You could have just montaged the whole fucking season and started from season two with the kind of kind of Luther Swan character that you wanted him to be. You didn't have to make everyone on Netflix watch about 12 episodes of total shit to get to the point that you wanted to start at. And honestly, will there even be a season two of V Wars? Maybe. Um, you know, it's a Netflix show and it's on Netflix, so it's probably pretty cheap for them to host. Um, you know, and obviously, I mean, they are putting a lot of muscle behind it. There has been so much promotion. Ian Somerhalder has been doing Netflix-sponsored promotions for this show pretty much daily on his Instagram. So they're throwing a lot of weight behind this show. Probably people are tuning in, but I can't imagine anyone wanting to watch a second season of this shit. And if it was on a TV channel where they'd had to make a pilot episode, they'd had to pitch it, they'd had to see how the ratings went before getting a season two. No way in hell would it have probably even got past the pilot episode, let alone into season two. It, it was a hot mess. But uh, anyway, this is a gigantic rant at this point, and uh, I'm far too festive and Christmassy to be to be having angry vampire rants, but... um, oh. You know, I'm not even a TV snob, really. I mean, when it comes to vampires, I will watch or read anything. I've read all the Twilight books. I watch the movies on a semi-frequent basis. I, I will basically watch anything vampire-related. I'm not snobby about these things, but V Wars was just so bad. And I don't know how somebody who wrote such a terrible, terrible script managed to get their show through production with some pretty well-known actors when it's it's just empty, vacuous, cardboard cutout, makes no sense, plot holes everywhere, garbage, like what the fuck are Netflix smoking with this thing? Did they realise after a few episodes that this this is nonsense, but you know, now now Ian somehow has said on Instagram that it's gonna happen. Well it's it's gotta happen like I don't know how, because th there are still, like me, there are a lot of writers out there writing vampire stuff. I mean, a few years back, when I first started writing my vampire novels, a lot of agents and publishers literally had written on their submissions page, no paranormal romance or no vampire stuff, because they were, they were absolutely inundated in the Twilight True Blood era with vampire stuff. So, Given that, and given the fact that a lot of people still are writing vampire stuff, there must have been a better script out there that they could have used, put Ian Somerhalder into a character that either suited him better or at least had some had some personality, had some character traits. <sighs> Hot mess, hot mess, hot mess. But anyway, this is long. If you've seen it, tell me your thoughts. Did you actually think it was great? Am I just bonkers? Did you notice even more plot holes? Was there anything that bugged you about it that I actually didn't latch onto? Because there probably was. There was probably even more. But uh, anyway, this is long enough, so uh, over and out. Bye-bye. <laughs>